church family. Welcome to church tonight. Stand to your feet with me if you would. God bless you so much. Thank you for being here tonight. It's so good to have you and excited to worship with you tonight. Let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask God to have his way tonight in this place. Father God, we thank you, Lord, first and foremost, for your presence that's in this place. God, I believe that you have something mighty in store for your people in the house of God tonight. So Lord, I just ask from the beginning to the end of this service that your perfect will, God, would be accomplished in each and every life. And we're going to be quick to give you all the praise, all the honor, and all the glory in Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. I am chosen, I am free, I am living for eternity, free now forever, you pick me up, turn me around, set my feet on solid ground. Yours now forever. I believe oh, oh. And nothing's gonna hold me back. Nothing's, nothing's gonna, gonna hold me back. Slate is clean, a brand new day. Free now forever. Now boldly I approach your throne. To claim this crown through Christ my own. Yours now forever.
tonight if you have a need would you just slip your hand up just right where you're at tonight you've got a need tonight come on just worship the lord you're you're not lifting your hand for someone else to see we're lifting it in praise and worship unto him and surrender to his will for our lives lord you see our hands lifted all across this room tonight lord you know each and every life you know every situation that we're facing lord there's many in our church right now that are really going through difficult seasons and times lord god and so we just ask right now holy spirit that you would continue you to reach down and touch each and every one. God, you know every physical need, you know every financial need, every emotional need, God, every spiritual situation. Lord, you know each and every one of them way better than we do. And so, Lord, we just surrender our will and our way, God, our timing into your hands. And Lord, we ask that your perfect will would be accomplished in each and every life and in every situation. God, we thank you for the growth that happens in our lives through you answering our needs, Lord, but even more so 
that they become a testimony for other people to come to know you through your power on display through your church. We thank you for that tonight, God. I just pray you touch each and every one for your glory. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen and amen. Come on, if you got faith tonight, give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Again, God bless you so much. Thank you for being here tonight. Great looking Wednesday night crew. And uh, not just numerically, but y'all look good tonight. So I don't know what you did, but Christian led the way. He got dressed up for Wednesday night church. He's looking fly tonight. If you have your Bibles, you can open with me to Psalms 91. Psalms 91. We're headed back there tonight. Uh, we've been there for a couple of weeks. We're going to camp out there for a little while. And uh, just excited about what God's been speaking about that. But uh, just to make sure that you're aware of a few things uh, going on around here. Just make sure you're up to date on everything. I mentioned it Sunday, but thank you, thank you, thank you to all of you that came out on Saturday, helped us with our Easter egg hunt. We just had an awesome time, great turnout, and uh, I think it's always good, but I, Pastor Wayne and I were talking about it. One thing that we always mark uh, those events by are the meaningful conversations that we get to have with people, especially folks that don't go to our church, and so as it being an outreach, and we, we both felt like we had a lot of that on Saturday, so we praise God for that. We had several new families here. I think Pastor Donna told me she had five new families in kids' church on Sunday. And so just, just the Lord's doing something. And so just continue to pray for those folks. And uh, we know there's a lot of visitors that were here because of the production and visiting family and all of that. But uh, just excited about what God's doing. And thank you to all you that volunteered and helped out with that and uh, made Sunday happen as well. It's a great day. Uh, don't forget, uh, Saturday night prayer meeting, 6 o'clock to 7 o'clock. Just continue to beat that drum because it's the, it's the drum that makes everything beat. Uh, I just believe that and, and excited just to continue on our Saturday night prayers. So love for you to come be a part of that six to seven each and every Saturday night. And uh, also remind you that um, uh, we are fasting on Wednesdays. So I just want to encourage you in that. I've mentioned it for a few weeks now. Uh, there are a lot of needs represented in the church, some very serious situations going on right now. I'm going to even speak to that a little bit in the message tonight. Uh, but there's power that comes from fasting and praying. Some of you maybe have experienced that. Maybe some of you haven't. If you haven't experienced it, I would encourage you to fast and pray. Try it out, all right? Uh, Jesus said in Mark chapter 9 that these kind only come out through prayer and fasting. There's a certain level of deliverance and breakthrough uh, in the spiritual realm that, that just prayer alone won't cut it. That there needs to be fasting coupled with it. And, and I say this, we teach on it at the end of the year, beginning of the year, uh, talking about fasting. It's not about twisting God's arm. It's really about positioning ourselves to hear from the Lord and to get our lives lined up with his will, knowing how to pray into his will. And so, again, I'm going to speak to that a little bit more. But just want to encourage you, uh, I, I'm doing it that way. And I know sometimes we don't talk about it. We fast sometimes we don't publicize it. But I just feel like this is a, a congregational fast that I'm calling you to on Wednesdays. Uh, you do it how the Lord leads you. We're doing it. For, until after church. So uh, you can stop eating. If you want to do a whole 24 hour, you can maybe not eat dinner on Tuesday night and go all day Wednesday. I just think there's something powerful that's going to break through. It might not be this week. It might not be next week. I don't know when, but these Wednesday night services, I just feel like that God's wanting to lay a new anointing on them. And if we show up in here with empty bellies, but hungry hearts, I'm just telling you, I think God's going to do something with that. I felt the Lord in, in leading you in that. And so I just encourage you, I don't have an end date on it. I just feel like it's something we're supposed to be doing. So just want to encourage you to join us in that. And uh, also we were getting through Easter before we uh, have the meeting. We're getting ready to set it. But if you'd still like to volunteer in kids church, uh, please sign up at the welcome kiosk. That sign up, she is still there. And uh, it's not this week, but I'll go ahead and give you a heads up. Second Saturday of the month. So not this Saturday, the following Saturday be men's breakfast at 8 a.m. And then the third Saturday, women's breakfast at 9 a.m. encourage you to come. Okay. In April this month, ladies, you won't have women's breakfast because of the women's conference that's happening in Branson. So see Pastor Ashley if you got any more questions about that. But the men will meet the second Saturday. Thank you for that. Psalms 91, I want to get you back there tonight. We've been reading from the New King James Version where the title of this particular scripture is Safety of Abiding in the Presence of God. And we've just been talking about how God's called us to abide in him. That doesn't mean that I just meet with him every once in a while, but abide is to reside. It's to live there, to inhabit there. And I believe that that's what God desires with us is to have habitation with us. Amen. 
God wants relationship with us and intimacy in that way. We're not going to read the entire chapter like we have been. I want to read the first eight verses with you, and then we'll do a little recap and jump into new stuff tonight. But Psalms 91, verse number one, New King James says, He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I'll say of the Lord, he's my refuge and my fortress. My God in him I will trust. Surely he shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence. He shall cover you with his feathers and under his wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. You shall not be afraid of the terror by night, nor of the arrow that flies by day, nor of the pestilence that walks in darkness, nor of the destruction that lays waste at noonday. Verse 7 says, a thousand may fall at your side and 10,000 at your right hand, but it shall not come near you. Only with your eyes shall you look and see the reward of the wicked. Can I just remind you before we jump into this, just remember that the whole goal of this prayer in Psalms 91 is that we would realize and take delight in the manifested presence of God. That's what this is all about. It's about, that's why I like the way the New King James writes that with that title is because it's talking about there is safety, there is provision, there is protection when we abide in the presence of the Almighty. When we get into the presence of God and we remain in the presence of God, that is where it's at. And that's the goal is that we know that the only place for real protection, the only place for complete provision in your life is in the presence of God and in his will for your life. And so we begin. Again, verse 1, he who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. We, we talked about it for the last couple of weeks, but there is a place that is secret that God desires for you to come to, a secret place with the Lord. Secret meaning not public, not around everyone else, but a place where you get alone with God, that you that you hide alone with him. And, and again, it's not really talking about a temporary place, but a dwelling place, a home, a, a habitation. It's personal. It's private. It's secret. It might be a place you go. It might be a, a certain time of day, but we have that place where we get alone with God, and the focus is alone time with him. Then, then we see in verse 2 where it says, I'll say of the Lord, he's my refuge and my fortress, my God in him I'll trust, and we talk about how our confession matters. We ought to be confessing to the Lord that he is our refuge, that we put our hope, that we put our trust in him. But the tense of that verse is not that we would declare to the Lord, but that we would declare to other people that he's my refuge and that he's my fortress. That's a faith builder when when it's not just about you in your private time, but after spending time in the secret place, you come out with the praise of God on your lips that whoever you meet, they know in your life that he is your hope, that he is your trust, that he is your refuge, that he is your fortress. And then we see in verse three, surely he shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence. And we talked about that's a promise of deliverance. I just want to encourage you and I could, I could just really key in on that because as I see what's happening in the church, I just believe that the enemy for too long has had free reign of keeping people in bondage. And I believe that we have, not just as a landmark church, but I really feel like that the church by and large, and when I say the church by and large, I'm not talking about the seeker-friendly aspect of the church. I'm talking about the the aspect of the church that's really seeking God's will and God's presence in this hour that we're living in these last days. I believe that, that in that part of the body of Christ, that there is a new awakening that's begun maybe a couple years back, but especially over the last 12 months, the last 14 months, not just in our region, but by and large across the country, that there's been this awakening to the idea, the understanding that that there really are. We've said it for years. I grew up in church and we always talked about the devil's real and he's after you, but but we didn't really get into the nitty gritty of that God has promised deliverance. We, we talk about all that and then we go, well, we just got to deal with it. Like, I just got to go through it, and I just got to keep fighting it my whole life and keep fighting it. But I'm here to tell you tonight that the promise of God is deliverance for your life. It's not that the enemy would continue to plague you and continue to, to wreak havoc on you and that you would continue to be tossed by every wind and wave. But God's plan for you is a promise of deliverance. I don't know about you, but that, that changes things for me. When I understand that God has promised me deliverance, then when I don't experience the deliverance that he's promised, I go, why not? We want to point the blame everywhere else, but really it comes right here to go, what am I allowing in to not see the deliverance happen 
And so I'm just encouraging you, and again, we talk about fasting and praying. Deliverance happens when we fast and when we pray, we gain dominion over that. So I just believe that, that God, we often focus on the miracle and, and on the outcome and the provision and the protection, but God's more concerned with the relationship. He's more concerned with the intimacy aspect of it. And so when we spend time with him, that's when, whenever those things begin to come and unlock in our lives. Psalms 91 verse number four says, he shall cover you with his feathers under his wings. You shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and your buckler. And I know I'm going fast right now, but it's because I'm recapping. So if you haven't been here the last couple of weeks, you can go back and listen, and you can hear the slowed down version of these four verses. We're getting sped up, but we're getting ready to slow down in a moment. And the fourth thing that we saw was that there is a place of hiding in him, and our greatest place of safety is under his wings. Why? We talked about last week, because that's where his heart's at. When you get up underneath his wings, you get up and begin to hear the heartbeat of God. I think about at the Last Supper, when you think about John was reclining back against Jesus, he was in that place of hearing his heartbeat. I I just believe that's a picture of what God desires to have with us, that we would get into that place. And when we start talking about hiding, we automatically think like, like that's a cowardly thing to do to hide out, right? But no, no, what God's saying is when you come and hide in me and you hide with me, that's where you gain the strength to be able to come out from hiding and be victorious in life. Our strength to run in into battle is found in our intimacy with God in the secret place. And I really believe that the greatest problem that faces believers today is that we're not spending enough time hiding in him, finding a secret place. We're, we're looking to, to, to go off of the heels of someone else's secret place. Well, it's the pastor's job to seek the Lord and then he'll give us the word of the Lord. Can I tell you that that's not the way it's supposed to be? God has a word for you for your life. I'm thankful that he uses me and you allow him to use me in your life, but I'm not the end all be all. He, he has a word for you and it's found in between the covers of this book right here. He has a word for you every single day and I can't draw it out for you every day, but you can. You can get into the secret place. You can hide in him and you can, people often wanna come and go, pastor, could you, could you tell me what God's will is for my life? I would love to be able to tell you that, but more often than not, I can tell you what God's will is not for your life than what it is for your life. And a lot of times people, that's really the answer that they need because they're wanting to do something that don't line up with this and they want me to tell them that it's okay, but I can't tell them it's okay because he didn't say it was okay. You know what I'm saying? Okay, so we understand that God has a plan for us in that, but we've got to get into the secret place, hiding in him to be able to come out and do what, what he's created us to do. So now let's move on to some fresh verses in verse number five and number six. We hear this, God says, you shall not be afraid of the terror by night, nor of the arrow that flies by day, nor of the pestilence that walks in darkness, nor of the destruction that lays waste at Noonday. God's speaking to us here in two different ways about nighttime and daytime. And there's meaning behind that. But the first thing that I want to tell you, the fifth thing that we see as we unpack this is that we should not be afraid of the dark. And I don't just mean like if I had them in the back, turn the lights off and you'd be like, ah, it's dark in here. I'm talking about like dark. We don't need to be afraid of the dark. Think about this now. One of the reasons that we're fasting on Wednesdays is because a byproduct of fasting is that we become more aware of the spiritual warfare that's going on around us. Here's what I find. When I, when I fast, I get hungry. I'm hungry right now. I haven't ate a bite of anything all day. I'm not bragging, I'm just telling you something. I'm hungry. But you know what it does is I don't get distracted by what I'm eating or not eating, I, I'll tell you this, I am this size for a reason. We was talking about before, Grace said the doctor told her to put some fat on. I said, girl, you just come hang out with me for a week. We will fat you up. I promise you, I got you covered. You can have some of mine. I'll just give you some of it. In fact, it was yesterday. I'm getting way off track, but I'm going to tell it anyways. I, yesterday, I was walking through the house. I had my shirt off, and I felt my back right here, and it was like ice cold. Anybody have that problem? You don't want to raise your hand. You had that problem. If you're as big as me, you got that problem. It was ice cold, and Ella happened to be standing in the hallway, and I said, hey, touch that right there. And she just like poked. I said, no, lay your hand on there and feel it. She goes, that's cold. Why is that cold? And I said, well, my body has decided that it's too hard to pump blood to everywhere, and so it's picked some places where it's decided it's not going to flow, and that happens to be one of them, and I'm hoping it's like an iceberg someday. Just 
gets so cold that it just, it just falls off and drifts away. That's what I'm hoping for. But I'm just telling you, I, I'm this size because I like to eat, okay? I'm telling you something. And, and when I eat, sometimes then I get lethargic and I get tired. But can I tell you, when I'm fasting, it's amazing that the, the, even, even through the hunger pain, even through I get a little bit, I drink more coffee. Like some of you don't drink coffee when you fast. I drink coffee. Well, that's why I'm probably talking as fast as I am tonight because I had like six cups of coffee today and no food to docile it down. And so I just tell you, like, I drink the coffee and I get that way. But, but I'm just telling you, I get tuned in with the Lord in a way that I'm not otherwise. Even these Wednesdays, these last few Wednesdays, it's like, I know, like, okay, God, you're going to speak something today. Can I tell you, at the same time, the devil starts attacking more? But the Bible says that we're not unaware of his scheme, so I know he's coming. But I get more tuned in to his attack, and I can see through it, and I can see that the issue's not with flesh and blood, right? And so that's what fasting does. It makes us more spiritually aware. We become aware of things that maybe before you thought were coincidence, but are actually warfare that's being waged against you. You see, when... When you start realizing that God has promised deliverance in your life, there's a reason that he promised deliverance. It's because you're going to need deliverance because the devil's trying to still kill and destroy you, right? And so as we see that, one of the, the, the biggest area of spiritual warfare, I believe, takes place in your mind. We often want to see it manifested out here, and we say this is the biggest attack, but really the biggest attack on you happens right here inside your mind. And, and what I mean is not that it's simply in your imagination, but that there's real warfare going on in your thought realm. Like that, the devil, here's the thing, can we be real? The devil doesn't have to get you in some secret sin to throw you off track. He just has to get you thinking wrong, right? He doesn't have to get you in some pornographic addiction. He just has to get you not thinking the way that God wants you thinking, starts messing with your thinking. Just track with me for a moment. There, there is a constant spiritual battle for our thoughts to determine which reality we choose to live in. And we see the reality here, and, and I speak about this often, but I think it's so true though, is that we, we live in this reality and what we see, touch, and feel we think is reality, but there is a spiritual reality that is far more real than the reality that you and I are currently living in. Way more real, that will last way longer than what we are living in right now. And so we, we live, and here's the thing, we have a choice. Will we live with the mind of Christ or from, from the mind of all that is inferior to that? I, I don't know if you've experienced this, but seemingly we often face more personal problems in the nighttime than during the daytime. Some of you maybe haven't experienced this, but I would say there's a number of you that will just track with me for a moment. We're talking about not being afraid of the dark. Just hear me for, for a second, not like a child's afraid of the dark. Just, just go with me for, for a minute. And here's the thing. The enemy desires to rob you of your sleep. Sleep is a gift from God. I need one of those hats, just so you know I'm putting a plug here because some of you like to give me stuff. I need one of those hats that says, Jesus takes nap. I just want to be like Jesus. I could use that hat. I'm just letting you know. Uh, but you think about that. Like he's trying to rob you as many times that, that, that God gives instruction. Sometimes it happens at night. A lot of times at night, God designed sleep for our benefit. When you sleep, it's where you recover. You realize that God created us. You think about this for a second. If you sleep like on average eight hours a night, which some of us are like, I dream for eight hours a night. That would be amazing to get eight hours a night. But you think about it for a moment, that's a third of your life that you spend to sleep. God created you for that. It was supposed to be a time of rest and rejuvenation. Can I tell you, there's sometimes we have conversation where I'm like, I wish that we lived back in the day. Like I don't really wish because I like indoor plumbing, but like part of me wishes for the day like where there was no electricity, when things were slowed down, when things were way less fast paced, I know I'm not tough enough to live back then, but I like to think that I am, right? And it's like, that would be amazing to be back. Some of you were like, we know what it was like to be raised without indoor plumbing. Pastor, you got no clue. I get that. Well, I'm just saying like the slowdown, we have, we have sped up life so much now. 
things move at such a fast pace that there's this reality that God desires for us to slow down and rest and, and recover. And here's the thing, when that's taken away at night, our daytime lifestyle is automatically affected. I just speak a little bit. Ashley and I have experienced this for many years. In fact, the enemy has tried with both of our children in different seasons as they were growing up to create bad sleeping habits, to rob us of peaceful rest. Uh, it also has, has dictated days, even through nightmares of our kids. Some of you have experienced that with your children that they have. And we've, we've dubbed that off as just being a normal thing. But I'm telling you, it's an attack of the enemy on your family to bring those things upon your children, to rob your home of the peace that God desires for there to be there. And so can I tell you that we didn't just like get medication to fix that. And we didn't just like read self-help books to fix that. You know what we did? We fasted and we prayed and God broke that. Deliverance came in that and our kids sleep. Now, does it happen every once in a while? Yes. But you know what our kids know? We're going to pray and God's going to come in and we're going to get some rest tonight because he's our strength. My oldest was sick the other day and we were talking about what are we going to do for her? And she said, I don't know what to do for her. And Julie is almost nine. She says, I know what to do for her. We need to get around her and pray for her. I'm like, praise God. That is what we need to do, right? They understand that because they've seen God work in our family in that way. And so anxiety will rob you of the lifestyle of rest, which ultimately becomes a lifestyle of faith. Can I just tell you tonight, I'm not talking about being lazy. I'm talking about spending time resting so that you can be rejuvenated. You see, here's the thing. When you hide under the wings of the Almighty, when you, when you hide in him in the secret place, that's not a place where you get your wheels spinning all the time. That's a place where you slow down. Go, okay, God, I'm in you. I know this might seem kind of practical, but we need practical. Bless you. We need practical, right? We need that sometimes. And here's the thing. Verse five calls it the terror by night. It says, you shall not be afraid of the terror by night. Here's the thing. If the enemy wins the battle over the night, he's brought a lessening of your creative influence and your clear thinking during the day. If he can steal your night, he's automatically stole your day. And here's the thing, it's, it's like your voice in some measure has been compromised. And what we need to do is prepare ourselves for victorious sleep. Some of you have already mastered this. Some of you need some help with it. So I'm gonna help you just for a moment. Here's the thing, keep away from things that cause you to be anxious at night. If you have trouble sleeping at night, you can ask my wife, when I lay down and I close my eyes, if she wants to tell me something, she's got about 30 seconds and I'm gone. At least for a couple hours till the dog needs to go out. And then it takes a beating for me to wake up to take him out. I'm just telling you, I'm, I'm well equipped to tell you what I'm about to tell you. We have, we have made an agreement in our marriage, and you can ask her this true, it's true. We made an agreement years ago, early on in our marriage, that we would not talk about anything of significant importance after 10 p.m. That's the rule in our house. Why? Because inevitably, when we would talk about finances, things that could cause some stress, right? Church issues, family issues, whatever it might be. We start talking about those things in a late hour, then all of a sudden now I'm restless. For hours it's taken me to fall asleep because I'm thinking about those things and I'm getting robbed of those things. And so we just decide, hey, we're not gonna, we're not gonna talk. If you didn't talk about them, we talk about them earlier, we get them settled and then we can go to bed. I tell you, it's been a huge source for us of relief to not do that. For some other, uh, another key practice is, is to not watch TV to fall asleep. I do that growing up. Like growing up, I have the TV on, I fall asleep. I wake up in the middle of the night, TV's still on. I just encourage you, don't do that. Some of you are like, well, I need noise, I need something. Turn some worship music on. Get in the word before you go to sleep. You'd be amazed at how your dreaming life would change if you would just get in the word for five or 10 minutes before you fall asleep. I'm just telling you, this sounds practical. It's like, you were preaching, now what are you doing? I'm just telling you, the devil wants to bring terror of night in your life. And there's a way to combat that. And so rather spend time with the Lord before, but allow the word of God and the spirit of God to be the last thing on your mind before going to sleep. Maybe again, put some worship music on. If there are things that bring anxiety, schedule time to deal with those kind of things before you ever go and get in bed. Do you know this? Some people talk about, it. don't go to bed angry. Don't, don't go to bed upset. I have a, a, a friend that uh, I saw on Facebook the other day. She had posted about her daughter, their pastor friends up North Missouri, and their daughter is, I think she's like 12, maybe 13, and uh, she had written a note on her phone to remind herself to be angry tomorrow. 
And her mom was like, why did you put this? And she goes, well, when I go to bed at night, I don't want to be mad when I go to bed. So I get over it, but I still want to be mad about it tomorrow. So I've set a reminder on my phone to wake up angry about it tomorrow. <laughs> it's hilarious. But I just tell you, like, don't go to bed mad because anger works deep into our souls. It affects our inner beings. And so before going to bed, to bed shed, some, shed some of those things that would concern you and confess your trust in God in that. Put your concern in his hands and rest in his promises over your life. I'm just telling you, the devil wants to steal your night so that he can steal and rob you of your days, but God wants you to get rest in that. And so we just understand that there's, there's an arrow that flies by day. There's a destruction that lays waste at noon, but God says, you don't have to be afraid of those things. I've got you. You can rest in him. Where? Under his wings, up next to his heart, in the secret place. Let's go on to verse number seven. Psalms 91, verse number seven, a thousand may fall at your side and 10,000 at your right hand, but it shall not come near you. Only with your eyes shall you look and see the reward of the wicked. Atlee, if you could come back for me. The sixth thing that we're gonna see and we're gonna spend a little time praying tonight as we have been at the end of each of these messages, but the sixth thing is that we are refusing fear on all sides. The devil wants you to be fearful. He wants you in anxiety. He wants you worrying about things that are outside your control. That's his desire, right? To, to get you to worry and to fear. These, these two verses bring us to a choice that I really believe determines your future. Think about it. We have the opportunity to not fear regardless of what's surrounding us, or we can be fearful about it. Right? That, that, that's the choice that we have to make. You get this picture. We're standing. This is the picture that's, that's descriptive for us. We're standing and people all around us start dropping like flies. Think about that. That's what it says. A, a thousand may fall at your side and 10,000 at your right hand. That, that would seem to be a fearful place to be standing in. Right? To see people just dropping out all around you. But God says it shall not come near you. That's a promise from the Lord that it shall not come near. Only with your eyes shall you look and see the reward of the wicked. L let, me just, let me just tell you, that, give you a word from the Lord. Seeing others fall is not a sign that you're gonna fall. We, we aren't bound by the failures and the bad experiences of other people. I think back just for a moment, and, and I don't even like talking about it, but I'm going to for a second. I think back to during COVID, how many people fell out of the church. And you could say fell out, walked away from church. I remember when we came back, it was like, well, where's that person? Where's that person? Where's that person? I, I just think about how that took some people out. And, and for some, I'm not even talking about how it just took them out necessarily physically, but took them out spiritually. People that used to be pillars of faith that now seemingly don't have any faith. How does that happen? How do we get to that place? Well, fear begins to creep in. And just because we've seen it all around us and not just about COVID, but other things and seen it all around us doesn't mean that it's gonna be our destiny as well. Again, we have a choice to make, be fearful or not. And here's the thing. I think some people think like, well, some people are just afraid. It's just their, their nature. Can I tell you that when Holy Spirit comes and resides in you, he can become your nature, should become your nature. People say, oh, this is just my personality. We, I just come from a family of worriers. Well, I've got news for you. The blood of the lamb is now your blood and he's not worrying for anything. What are you saying, pastor? I'm telling you that we are claiming things that God doesn't want us to be claiming over our lives. And I believe that God would call us, especially when we're fasting and we're praying, to become spiritually aware enough to begin to disclaim those things and say, that's not who, I'm not a worrier. In fact, that word's gonna leave my vocabulary. I'm not worrying about it, I'm trusting about it. 
I'm not, I'm not going to be fearful about it. I'm hoping in the Lord about it and not the kind of hope that is wishful thinking, but the kind of hope that is certain that God's going to come through for me and that I'll endure no matter what I have to walk through because I know that greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. And I know that he, I know I quote these promises, but you need to hear them tonight. I know that I'm the head and not the tail. I know that I wasn't a people, but now I'm a people. I'm a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a people belonging to God, that God has called me a son and and a daughter that I that I've been grafted in to the body of Christ that I'm an heir and a co-heir with Christ can I just tell you tonight that sometimes when that fear tries to creep in and you see other people laying out and you see other people messing up and you see other people falling away from the faith it's in those moments that you need to remind yourself who you are in Christ that you take a stand and that you you put a stake in the ground and say no I might have come from a long line of warriors but that's stopping here and now I, anxiety might have ran in my family, but it's not going to run in my family because I'm stopping it. I'm breaking free because deliverance has been promised to me by the word of God. But pastor, I can't stop being afraid. Well, then you're not spending enough time in the secret place hiding in the Lord because when you get up underneath his wings, up next to his heart, you're going to be reminded that you are protected, that you are provided for, that you are loved, that you have been called according to his plan and his purpose and that he's working all things together for your good because of that fact. And, and when we get to that place, we refuse fear on all sides, on all sides. We have a choice to make, fear or don't fear. But remember, God has, has declared the end from the beginning. And, and I've got to tell you, as a believer, and especially as a pastor, I see Psalms 91, these two verses, 7 and 8, to be of extreme importance. I, I don't want to see anyone fall away. To see, see the one that has fallen away, I want to see him come back. I, I want to see God redeem them and bring them back in. God's mercy is designed for the, the worst of us. And our prayers should constantly be for the mercy of God to be displayed, even on the ones who, who are most despised by our culture and by our society. We, we, we've got to be careful not to look at some people and go, well, they're beyond redemption. They're beyond this or beyond that. They may have seemingly fallen away, but God can raise them back up again. Can I, can I just tell you tonight, that's the hope that we, that we have. God's mercy is great. However, in these last days, there's going to be judgment upon the world. And my prayer is that as judgment comes, let it be used as a wake-up call for other people to repent and to get right with God just telling you tonight, this is not the time to go hide out in fear of what the world is bringing. It's the time to hide out in the Lord so that we can step into the world and be the light of the world. Jesus said, I, I've set you to be the light. The Bible says that he came to be the light of the world, but then before he left, he called us, you're going to be the light of the world, a city on a hill that other people would be drawn to, that you're the salt of the earth. That means that you preserve things and you make things better when you're around. That's what God desires for the church to look like and be like. But the only way that we can reflect him is when we spend time in him, when we hide in the secret place. If you would stand with me tonight. Again, just wanna hit the pause button right there. We'll pick up in verse number nine next week. As we spend time fasting and praying, I just believe that God, maybe there's somebody here tonight that maybe, maybe you're the one that ha has fear. Maybe the devil's been robbing your sleep. Maybe it's your children. Maybe it's your grandchildren. Maybe it's a coworker. Maybe it's a spouse. I don't know. But tonight, I believe that God wants you to begin to claim that the devil is not going to get your night anymore. That he, that God's bringing freedom, that God's going to erase that fear and that, that you would refuse fear on all sides that we stop just looking at the circumstances and we start looking at the one who is our creator, who is our provider, who is our protector. And when we get our eyes fixed on him and the things around us don't seem like such a big deal because we know that God is leading us through, that we don't have to have fear as we endure whatever this year brings at us. We know that we can face it because we're not facing it alone that God's with us. I'm going to open us in prayer and then I invite you if you want to come forward and pray. Feel free if you want to walk around the room, you want to make an altar where you're at. We got about 15 minutes here. We're just going to spend some time praying and seeking the Lord. Father God, I thank you that you have called us to the secret place. I thank you that you have invited us into the hiding place under your wings, up next to your heartbeat. Lord, I just pray tonight as we as we begin to pray, God, I pray, pray that you would just help us to commit, to commit ourselves to you, Lord, that we're not gonna let the enemy rob from us, but we know that you have guaranteed deliverance in our lives, that you've promised it, Lord, and that we can walk in that freedom and walk in that liberty, God, because of what you've already accomplished on the cross. So I just pray tonight 
tonight, Lord, that you would help us to begin to declare. Get, the, get those bad words, worry and fear and anxiety, get them out of our mouths, God, and change them, Lord, tonight for hope and trust and dependence upon you. We're going to see breakthrough come quickly. Come quickly in the name of Jesus. Anoint our prayer time tonight, God, to line up with your will. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Come on, let's just spend some time in prayer as Atlee leads us in worship.
are revealed to us. There's revelation there. Lord, I pray that you'd help each and every one of us in this season that we're walking through. And again, God, I know that many are facing difficult situations right now. I pray, God, as the devil's tried to pull us away from you and to get us to fall away and to be fearful of what we see around us in the economy and in the political realm and the culture, Lord God, that we in this moment, God, would fix our eyes on you. We get in your presence because there's safety of abiding in your presence. It's where we get everything that we need, God, to do what you've created us to do. And so I pray, Lord, that even tonight, maybe there's some here, Lord, that have been having sleepless nights, have been having nightmares in their family, in their home. I pray a perfect peace would just come over them in the name of Jesus, that you'd put a heavenly garrison around their home, around their thoughts, around their minds, around their sleep, God. As I pray over my kids, God, perfect dreams tonight, spiritual dreams, Lord, would come. There'd be no more terror of night. But God, we would get rest so that we can be and do all you've created us to do during the day. We thank you for that, God. We're not going to be fearful on any side, Lord, because we know you're in control. We put our hope and our trust firmly in you. We thank you for that tonight, God. We give you all the praise and all the glory. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen and amen. Come on, if you got faith in the Lord, give him a hand clap of praise tonight. Amen. Amen. God bless you so much. Shake some hands, hug some necks, encourage one another. We'll see you back Saturday night for prayer, 6 o'clock. God bless you.